Back in 1989, disappointing box office numbers off the back of the 16th James Bond movie License to Kill resulted in several key members from James Bond's historic movie history leave the franchise. Albert Broccoli, one of the co-producers alongside Harry Saltzman, was even in talks to sell the name. They were both responsible for bringing Bond to the big screen from the relatively low budget of Dr. No, the breakout success that was from Russia with Love and every movie up to this point. But considering this was almost all they ever worked on, you could see that a change was most definitely needed. License to Kill's Timothy Dalton, the fifth James Bond, even said this in an interview. My feeling is this will be the last one. I don't mean my last one, I mean the end of the whole lot. I don't speak with any real authority, but it's sort of a feeling that I have. Legal troubles between Dan Jack, the owners of the Bond's name, and PATH Communications resulted in nothing happening for quite a long time. This was when further responsibilities got handed down from Albert Broccoli to his daughter Barbara Broccoli and her half-brother Michael Greg Wilson to work as producers on the James Bond franchise, whilst he stayed in the office dealing with more legal issues. And even though he did stay on for James Bond's 17th movie as a presenter, it was his two kids that would bring James Bond to the 90s to a new audience with yet another fresh-faced cool guy taking center stage and on the 13th of November 1995 we got GoldenEye Yet after Timothy Dalton's six-year Bond contract expired, the torch was handed to Pierce Brosnan. The film was a huge success, gaining $350 million at the worldwide box office, coming in fourth that year behind Apollo 13, Die Hard with a Vengeance, and Toy Story. The reviews even to this day still rate the movie fairly highly, and from what I remember, being an 11-year-old lad at the time, it was finally a James Bond that not only my dad liked, but also me. He was still cool and suave, he still said the popular one-liners, but most importantly, and you know, maybe this was due to my age, I no longer watch James Bond movies just for the cool stunts. I watched the whole thing, and I bloody loved it. This was a common theme for youngsters around my age from what I remember, who by the way, in the world of video games, have started to grow up a little bit moving on from the 16-bit era to the PlayStation, Sega Saturn and N64 era. So, obviously, shortly after the release of Nintendo's fifth generation console in 1997 when GoldenEye got adapted to the GoldenEye game, no matter what console you decided to be loyal to at the time, the legendary GoldenEye was indeed on your radar. And today, we're going to look at exactly why that was. So, Join me as we look at the complete history of GoldenEye, where we'll be looking at the game's history, its surprising inspirations, its questionable remakes, and of course, its games too. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Now before we go ahead, secret spy, secret agent, secret ladies and gentlemen, I have a very important message for you from this video sponsor, Skillshare. Want to be more like me, or him I suppose? Then I highly suggest you go to the affiliate link below to get yourself two whole months completely for free to become more like me, or him. You can't honestly expect to continue with this top secret video without learning how to sharpen a knife, do you? Or how to make the perfect martini. Don't forget to make your own bow tie. A secret agent is completely useless without it. And of course, if you want to be more like me, someone who has absolutely no problem getting what they call a Bond girl, then be sure to brush up on your dancing, become a pro at poker, or may I suggest the lazy lovers in bed spooning massage? All of these courses, plus thousands and thousands upon thousands more, can be found over on Skillshare. And if you use my affiliate link below, not only will you become a better spy, you will be helping create further videos like these on my channel. Anyway, that's the end of the little sponsorship bit right here. If you did indeed click that link below, you may continue with the video. And if you didn't, <laughs> yes, please do continue with the video. I spent <laughs> ages on these videos, please. Uh. 
So here we are back in the 90s at Rare. They were a company known for creating fantastic games, mostly on Nintendo systems, games such as the Donkey Kong Country series and Killer Instinct series obviously need no introduction at all. But even though you may associate the company almost completely with Nintendo's properties during this era, and honestly I can see why, they did also make plenty of games based on popular licenses too. Earlier games such as Wheel of Fortune, Sesame Street, WWF, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Spider-Man, Nightmare on Elm Street and just so many more were partly or completely worked on by this company. And as Nintendo was about to enter the fifth generation pretty late on after the launch of the already hugely popular Sony PlayStation and struggling Sega Saturn, they knew that they needed to change up their strategy rather quickly if they was going to stay relevant. This resulted in the company wanting to get out as much content as possible for that system, especially American themed games in an attempt to gain interest in all regions. This is when Hiroshi Hamashi, who had previously purchased the licensing rights to adapt James Bond's GoldenEye into a game, which in case you were wondering was not just a big IP on western shores but in Japan also, decided not to make it in Japan but instead, just like the majority of Bond's movies to date, make it in the UK and to get their most loyal third party company Rare involved in doing just that. Rare obviously accepted this big name license and got to work brainstorming a 2D platforming Super Nintendo game similar to earlier games such as Robocop. It all seemed pretty obvious in all honesty, however a licensing game? Yuck. Rare was a company of about 40 odd people and as history has taught us, nobody cares about movie adaption games. They normally sell well enough of course on the basis of the name alone, but for the most part they suck. As you would expect, several games were being worked on at the same time at the company, games that were obviously going to be a big hit, and nobody wanted to work on this game at all. Well, almost nobody. This is Martin Hollis, the guy who was responsible for taking on the challenge. He'd worked on a couple of Killer Instinct games beforehand, in fact he was actually working on one at this point. But as he was such a huge fan of James Bond, he decided to take on the challenge with the only criteria being that it would be made on the N64 back when it was known as the Ultra 64, which at the time the team didn't even have. They were using the same silicon graphics systems that were these huge beasts of a computer the size of a washing machine that were previously used for making the signature pre-rendered graphics that the company was known for at the time. Also, little bonus fact for you, originally not only did the team not have proper N64s or even N64 development kits, but they didn't even have the signature N64 controller either. Nope. In the very, very, very early days, they actually used a modified Sega Saturn controller when making GoldenEye. The rest of his team that literally only consisted of a few people were all brand new workers at Rare. They just never worked on a game before. And as time went on, this team never grew any larger than just nine people. Now this may seem scary and I'm sure it was, most of the team didn't have any experience at all and I'm not just talking experience in making games, I'm also talking experience on limitations too. If the crew thought up a cool new idea they would simply just do it and then cry when it comes to the realisation that it was a bit too far fetched. The team joked that nowadays some of those ideas would instantly be shot down but due to this being the majority of the team's first ever game, naivety and ambition pushed those obviously great great but back breaking hard mechanics and gameplay styles into a reality, no matter how much they may have regretted them. And that's why GoldenEye sticks out a little compared to Rare's more typical releases up to this point. Sure it's a rare game by name, but not so much by nature, and boy did it go through some changes before they even knew what they wanted to do with it. As stated, firstly, GoldenEye was not intended to be a first person shooter multiplayer deathmatch thrill ride, but instead a 2D side scrolling platformer for the SNES. This was changed to a 3D game, however, as the game's director Martin Hollis, who wanted the game to be made on Nintendo's next system, the Ultra 64, they decided to use Virtua Cop as the basis to make this eventual launch title. The first rough level design which was the power plant by Carl Hilton actually was on rails, however this didn't actually last that long as you would expect. 
In fact, it was only after a short video of the game was shown off in Japan where onlookers took notice and everyone just thought that this was a first person shooter. The team were already toying with the idea of changing it from an on rails to the obvious first person shooter anyway and this was the final push they needed. After all, it was well documented that the team were already taking plenty of inspiration from games such as Doom anyway. Giving this game this new style just seemed to work. And one of the other reasons for the change to a more movement based 3D gameplay style was when the team tried to implement missions. Obviously putting the character on one single path heavily limits the player's choices when acting as the world's greatest spy. And by doing this, the game changed from a shoot everything you see into a more solid mission based style that everybody loves. But with that said, one feature they did want to add from these early days was location based shooting. If you shoot a hand, the gun would be dropped. If you shoot a leg, the character would collapse down that way. Animations created of the bad guys rolling out and jumping from behind crates were also implemented at this point, which is obviously very typical for an on rails like game like Virtua Cop or even Time Crisis just not so much for first person shooters. But hey, looking back, it's all part of GoldenEye's charm. These animations were created by team members themselves that would get rigged up to a very primitive motion capture system called FOB or Flock of Birds, which consisted of several wires all being attached from different joints of the body and in an interview with one of the designers, Duncan Botwood, he recalls just what it was like working on the game one day and then having to become a motion caption actor the very next. It was being filmed in a sweaty little room just after all of the moves had been used to capture Killer Instinct 2 Arcade and f***ing hell it stank. I had to do forward rolls not knowing if when I come up I'd be strangling myself on the wires because of that setup. A small part of the team were also invited onto the sets of the movie and with a digital camera took pictures of those sets so that they could recreate them in the game. However, for the characters themselves, it turned out that it would be quite difficult to get all of the extras from the movie included as they would need to be perfect face on flat photographs taken of each one of them, which they didn't have at their disposal. However, what they did have was those 40 odd members of staff at Rare as well as random plumbers and tech guys that just happened to be around at the time. And that's why they ended up in the game themselves. And easily the most popular of these characters was of course Dr. Doak, aka David Doak who was also a doctor of biochemistry himself which meant they didn't just use his face in the game but they used his name too. And looking at the guy's avatar on Twitter, <laughs> yeah I think he's pretty chuffed at that. Now moving on to the multiplayer of the game which is a feature which I am most familiar with as I'm sure many others are. You may be surprised to hear that it actually got added on quite late in the development of the game. How late? Well the movie had been and gone at the cinemas and the release of the VHS tape in hindsight would have been a good time to release this game. However, whilst the work was almost done on the game, only needing a touch up here and there, Mark Edmonds, one of the team leads on the game was secretly, with management not knowing and after being instructed by David Doak, tried to figure out if multiplayer would even work in a game like this. Rare had been pushing for Nintendo to change the upcoming Nintendo 64 system into a 4 controller console rather than a 2 controller system, constantly reminding them how impressive Mario Kart would be as a 4 player game. So it only seems right that this game would also feature 4 player deathmatches. Not long before its release, Mark showed the team what he'd been working on and as it was just so, so incredible, they quickly realised that they needed to delay the game for another 6 months in order to get it to work. And by this point, the game was already 8 months late, but that multiplayer aspect was just too good to throw away. This obviously involved plenty more animations being needed, as you can technically now see them all running around, and it also meant that the team, or more specifically B. Jones, one of the artists on the game, was able to add a few more characters too. And she chose Mayday, Baron Samedi, Jaws and Odd Job. Every night for several months the team would get together and play this multiplayer mode for a couple of hours, tweaking the mechanics, adding in new features and removing others, until it was by 1997 standards at least, the perfect home console multiplayer first person experience. But surprisingly, these four characters were not the only people added to this mode in the first place. Nope, 
In fact, at one point during its development, this feature was going to include all of the previous James Bonds. We already had Pierce Brosnan, but you were also going to have Roger Moore, Sean Connery, and Timothy Dalton. This was done obviously to attract more gamers with the obvious marketing clout, however that all fell through when one of the top dogs at Eon, who actually owns the Bond license, came in and just shut it all down. And on that final day before removal, the dev team played a huge death match with all of the Bond characters to 100 kills which lasted a good three hours. And it was actually Mark Edmonds that won that match by just one kill with... Roger Moore, making him the ultimate James Bond, I suppose. You have a nasty habit of surviving. Well, you know what they say about the fittest? Anyway, all of the extra features were added, the management at Rare only told Nintendo what they needed to know as they had been threatened to shut the game down several times due to how many delays it was getting, and finally, when it was released worldwide on the 25th of August 1997, it... yeah, it did pretty well. <laughs> How to use one of these? Goldeneye, load a rumble pack and see how it feels when 007 meets M64. If you was like me and you scoffed the N64 owners because you was a PlayStation, Sega, Saturn, or even a PC guy, there was no denying that Goldeneye was very tough to ignore. Somehow, and although this may be hard to think for new gameplay styles. Rare had made a first person shooter work flawlessly for the time on a console, something that competing titles for the time were just not able to replicate. The game received insane reviews and gamers around the world had a new addiction. The single player was great mixing up stealth gameplay with fast paced shooting mechanics, but the multiplayer is what brought people back time and time again. Along with several other titles of course, this was one of the games that put N64 on the map. If you didn't have one, you wanted one, and on the lead up to this release, Rare knew it. They were so sure that people would love this game that 20 copies famously got sent out to blockbuster stores for free with the chance to send it back within two months if you didn't like it. And according to reports, nobody ever did. In fact, GoldenEye was the number one rented game from Blockbuster for a whole three years running. On Christmas of 1997, the game did gangbusters, selling out everywhere. Nobody could get hold of this title, which actually resulted in more copies being sold in Christmas of 1998, and there are even reports that say that there was even more copies sold on Christmas of 1999 than both 97 and 98 combined. Well, in the UK at least. The game ended up coming in second place on the best selling games for the N64 by the end of its life being beaten by Mario 64 and yes, that means that there were more copies of GoldenEye sold than Mario Kart 64, which came in third place and the Ocarina of Time came in fourth. And so, like I said, I think it's safe to say that GoldenEye did pretty well. of GoldenEye, Kobe Bryant in NBA Courtside, the WCW vs NWO, or Diddy Kong Racing for new additions to the Player's Choice Library for just $39.95. But ladies and gentlemen, that was GoldenEye for the N64, you all know that game. However, as usual on the Complete History Show, we've actually got a little ahead of ourselves. So let's go back to the beginning. What? Sega? <laughs> yes. Before Nintendo had the license, Sega had it to make a pinball game. 
1995, Sega Pinball Inc. released the only James Bond movie licensed pinball game ever. Now honestly I do plan to cover Sega's pinball arm in more detail in the future, I've had a lot of fun playing tables such as South Park and of course Goldeneye, but obviously I am far 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 away from being any kind of pinball expert. When chatting to the experts however, they all seem to be in agreement and say that Sega pinball machines are not very good, they're a tad on the simpler side and not so great with the artwork, but this one is actually one of the better ones. There's not much else to say in all honesty, it's the fifth table that Sega ever released and like I said, I liked it and if you see it, it's definitely worth playing, you know, if you ask me, someone that doesn't play pinball machines too often. Anyway, let's bring ourselves back up to speed shall we with the far more popular N64 game. Here, see these two images? They are from an unreleased no doubt early build of a GoldenEye Virtual Boy game that was to be released alongside the N64 release. As you can see, this is a car combat game and well yeah, that's it. It's never been leaked and all we've got to go on are these images. Next up, it's worth talking about the unreleased remake, right? Yes! You see, this game did so well that not only did it make Valve rethink a few things for the upcoming Half-Life game, it also gained such a frenzy that when Microsoft eventually purchased Rare, a remake did indeed start for the Xbox 360 Live Arcade and what you're seeing here is that game. As you can see, it's still very much the same game and it's actually very far along. In fact, the game was reportedly only two months from being complete. But due to Rare's new management not being able to secure a deal with Nintendo on whether they should get a one lump sum of money or a cut of the game's revenue, the whole thing got canned and all we've got left is this sexy footage. The fans wanted a remake but instead what they got was this. <laughs> actually, the remake or spiritual successor or whatever you want to call it didn't actually come for quite a while. You see, after Nintendo had one more stab at the Bond license with the rather obviously named James Bond 007 for the Game Boy, Electronic Arts got the license and released an average game with Tomorrow Never Dies on the PlayStation, another average game with The World Is Not Enough on the same system and a slightly better version on the N64, a below average game called 007 Racing, I mean obviously that was going to be poor, another average game for his first jump into the next generation with 007 Agent Under Fire, a much better game called 007 Nightfire and finally another rather fine game called 007 Everything or Nothing, which was the final release during Pierce Brosnan's reign as the secret agent, leaving EA scratching their heads wondering what to do next. Fans of the Bond franchise should indeed check some of these games out as there is some genuine fun to have with a few of these later ones. I'm not going to go into detail now as we will be here all day, however the next game technically does fit into this video quite nicely. You see even though the sales numbers on these games were fine, I think it's safe to say that when you think about James Bond and video games, you just think Goldeneye. So, obviously with EA being EA, they announced in early 2004 that they was working on a game with the code name GoldenEye 2. Obviously this only lasted a couple of months before the final name was announced which was GoldenEye Rogue Agent, a game relying heavily on nostalgia of the GoldenEye name, but as stated, with Pierce Brosnan no longer playing Bond, in this game you play as someone actually called GoldenEye. Because, you know, he's got a golden eye. Really? The game does some rather risky things, like killing James Bond, your partner at the very beginning of the game, which is why you were fired and you've now become a rogue agent. You work for a guy called Goldfinger and you do so well that you get given a robotic golden eye. Mix all of this up with classic James Bond fights and voila, you got your game. Now, honestly, I remember not minding this game actually back in the day, but playing it now is a serious chore. I mean, technically, so is the original, Goldeneye, to a degree, but somehow this feels worse by today's standards. 
glue this gameplay with the rather strange story idea and you've got a very forgettable game that honestly I'm only talking about because it's got the golden eye name in its title yet has almost nothing to do with that original whatsoever cash grab yeah moving on as stated earlier on in the video, at one point an Xbox Live Arcade remake was at one point in the works, but on top of this, Nintendo was also in talks with Microsoft and Activision, the latest owners of the Bond name, to get the original ported to the virtual console. As you would expect with so many fingers in the pie, an agreement just couldn't be met, but Activision wasn't giving up. They wanted a GoldenEye game on the Wii, and they was gonna get one. They approached Free Radical with the project as several rare team members had actually moved over there, but an agreement just couldn't be made. So they went to Eurocom, a company who recently made Dead Space Extraction. This engine was reworked for the new GoldenEye game, and a few years later in 2010, we got the closest thing we ever got to a true sequel slash remake of the N64 classic. Now guys, before we go ahead, I just want to be brutally honest with you as possible. Your opinions may vary and I'm sure you'll voice them down below and you know what, I welcome it. But, although in the late 90s the original GoldenEye was indeed one of if not the greatest game in the world, it's not anymore. Even though I didn't own an N64 during this game's release, I knew plenty of people that did and yes, we played a crap ton of GoldenEye multiplayer, it was excellent. But by today's standards, it's an extremely hard game to play. The first person genre on consoles has come on leaps and bounds since this release and if you haven't played GoldenEye in what, 20 years? You only got to look at an N64 controller before you think to yourself, wait a minute, how the hell did I control this? I'm not saying the game wasn't great or legendary, or most importantly when looking at console first person shooters, probably the most influential game in that genre of all time. I'm just saying by today's standards, GoldenEye 007 for the Wii, and one year later it's reloaded HD re-release on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, are actually a lot easier to control. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please don't think I'm taking anything away from your childhood, that's not the aim here. Are these versions better? No. But that's something I don't honestly think any game could ever do. Sure the original game's graphics may look like a weird Minecraft ripoff by today's standards and the controls are rather awkward too, but besides all of that, it's only when you play this reimagining, and yes it is a reimagining not a remake, where you start to see what else the original game has to offer. It's been reported on a few times that Pierce Brosnan was never that big of a fan of video games, especially the classic GoldenEye game, and recently in an interview when asked did he ever play his record breaking game, he replied, <laughs> Daniel Craig on the other hand is a big fan of the games, Goldeneye in particular, so obviously he was totally on board with creating this reimagining, and that is exactly what it is. Who here would say that it's one of the greatest shooters of all time? Everybody set the standards for all video games in the future. It was the first game that I could play multiplayer for four hours straight. For me, it was the original. I mean, like, if you hooked it up now, I'd, I'd be down to play. Let's say that after 13 years of gaming innovation, a new GoldenEye game is coming up. Oh yeah. my god! Yes. <laughs> The majority of the sets are still here from the original, the gameplay is mostly intact, it's just a retelling of that original story with a few new plot twists done and both Daniel Craig and Judi Dench provide voice work for the game as well. Nobody ever died being too careful, words to live by. When looking at this thing like that, and it really should be looked at like that, it hits the nail on the head. The game was enjoyable, I played it through to completion when I got it on the Wii with its sexy golden controller, you know, for nostalgia purposes. And when looking at reviews for the time, they were all fairly positive. Some reviewers even went as far as saying that this was the Wii's very best first person shooter. And before you jump to the conclusion that that isn't exactly a hard thing to be, let me remind you that this game came out after both Metroid Prime 3 and the Metroid Prime Trilogy. And although, you know, I don't agree, I will say that it was indeed a good game. 
It may be forgotten now and completely scoffed at compared to the original, but it shouldn't. If you see it and you are a fan of Bond games, then you should definitely play it. It's as simple as that. Just know that when you're done, well, you're probably not going to want to play it again. And that is its biggest issue. By the time this game came out, it was easily comparable to plenty of other first-person shooters that, in all honesty, were a lot better. If you walked into a room halfway through someone playing this game, you'd think it's a remake of a Call of Duty game before thinking it's a remake of GoldenEye. And the more you play through the game, the more you realise just how similar it is to those standard shooters. Now, with that said, I completed it and I enjoyed it. But now I've got the HD version on the PlayStation 3, I don't know, I just can't bring myself to finish it. It's not bad, it's just a play it once sort of game. And it was here where I realised what made the original game just so goddamn good. It was a product of its time, and sure that can be viewed as a negative when looking at the ageing graphics and control scheme, but if you ask me, those graphics, those silly enemy animations, those faces of the developers, those customization unlockables, the fact that you're actually forced to play multiplayer in the same room as your mates, everything about GoldenEye for the N64 was done at the exact right time by a team of people that pushed boundaries that were not only not yet set, but honestly, few others had even started thinking about. GoldenEye is a fun and addictive game that has given gamers around the world collectively millions and millions of hours of enjoyment. It was groundbreaking for the time, but nowadays we're looking at the bigger picture. For me, it's actually its limitations that helps it stay relevant. And that's why when I see fan-made remakes and commenters crying that that Xbox Live version never got made, I sit here happily that we just never got them. If we did, all it would do is tarnish the memory of the original game. Take or add anything away from GoldenEye on the N64 and you will be messing with a game perfectly made within its constraints. <sighs> but with that said, dual analog support? <laughs> yeah, that would actually be quite nice. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. I want to give a big special shout out to all of my Patreons, but first let's give a shout out to Skillshare who have yet again sponsored one of these videos. Uh, a big fan of that site and uh, yeah, they, they seem to like my videos too, so that's great. Uh, yeah, if you want to uh, support the show and, and actually, you know, get good at whatever it is you're, you're, you're studying, you're learning, you want to get better at, then use the affiliate link below uh, uh, to get yourself uh, two whole months completely for free can't get better than free can you like i say it helps me out but anyway guys yes let's give a big special shout out to the patreons who help me out every single video uh with those uh people being <laughs> yeah where are we yes sorry with those people being gary pinkett mantis ryan burford andrew dalton ben jackson jonathan hayward kevin king Christopher Turnbull, Phil Lowlands, Rovan Army, Ryan Holtz, Retro to Next Gen, Hawk89, Dina, Robertson Dunn, Adam Lefty Taylor, Intrigued Gaming, Tim Labonte, Asobi Quang DX, Tim Lunn, Pixels.Limited, aka Samuel Victor, K Conrad Constantine, Pretendo64, Creamy Elephant, Casey Garner, Blitz Hedgy, Kinglink Reviews, you write Jim Knapp, Shadow Dial, Game Apologist, Chris Aplin, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Ye Old Hamburglar, Dan Petit, Lucas Softail, um, uh, Ronnie Method, SSWB, Solix Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus Kingimo Cut, Tyndall, The Geeky Dad, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Poole, Float to G, and of course, Petty Mew. As always, guys, if you want to get your name shouted out, get your name shown, come see what I'm working on, uh, see previews of videos that I am working on, you know, in their rough state when they're not yet finished, get uh, exclusive rooms in my Discord chat, uh, join random movie nights that we do, and all this other cool stuff, then, you know, click the link that you see on the screen. Don't forget to subscribe, give the video a thumbs up or a thumbs down, whatever you prefer. Uh, but that's enough for now, isn't it? Yes, so this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time.